Hey, everybody. I'm here with Grant Faber, uh, TEA expert, leader, air miners, uh, visionary, and air miners uh, songwriter. And hey, Grant. Hello. So Grant is, uh, he started a new business working on techno-economic assessment. I thought it'd be good to catch up with him about, uh, you know, what is TEA? Why do people need to know about it? Stuff like that. And I've always really appreciated my conversation with you, Grant, because you, you really do, you really like this stuff and you really deeply care that, that it happens and it happens properly. So glad to, glad to have this time to talk with you. Definitely, Tito. Likewise, yeah. I've been reading your newsletter for uh, probably years now, so <laughs> I'm honored to be on it. Yeah, it's happening. Um, so you've come and talked with the Launchpad Accelerator teams about, about techno-economic assessment. Um, and just to kind of kick things off, like why do, uh, why do people need techno-economic assessment? Like uh, in, in just to, you know, kind of in, in your view. Definitely. So at its simplest level, what TA really is, is mainly a cost accounting exercise. And it's a little more earlier stage relative to say financial accounting or very advanced cost accounting that a very large corporation might do to understand the cost of a new project. TEA can be applied to very early stage projects and ideas, ones coming right out of the lab. Even an idea that's just in someone's head, you could apply a very rudimentary form of TEA to it. And what it really helps us do is take all these technical parameters, often of a new kind of emerging process and apply, say, different levels of cost factors to those and just get an idea of what the current as well as what the projected costs of a given process might be. And it's particularly important for the clean tech industry because so often we're trying to scale these technologies up. We're trying to meet cost parity with some kind of status quo or conventional product. And we need to understand how long that might take, the extent to which we may need to rely on subsidies for the process, which may have implications for where you might be able to deploy uh, or even start your company. And a lot of investors and funders might want to see this information. And it's just good to get everyone thinking about and on the same page um, uh, for, uh, in, in terms of cost. So yeah, that's kind of a high level uh, view of it. Me And just like for people that are kind of more visual, like what, what does a techno-economic assessment look like? Definitely. So yeah, in terms of how it looks visually, you could think of the charts, the graphs that you might get after doing one. So for example, you might see a, uh, a pie chart, and I know there's a lot of hate uh, in, in <laughs> communities for pie charts, but uh, they are commonly used in TEA just for a simple breakdown of costs. And so for example, you might have materials, costs, energy, labor, and equipment, then you might have a pie chart showing the breakdown of costs and the percentage of each, how they contribute to your unit cost, which the carbon removal world is often going to be per ton of CO2 removed. You may also see a tornado chart or a tornado diagram that shows uh, how the results might change the overall cost, for instance. Um, if you were maybe to modify the different input parameters by a constant percentage. And so it more or less allows you to do a sensitivity analysis to see which things influence that final cost more so than others. You might be able to have different kinds of curves. Cost curve is a common one showing where costs may go over time, whereas you scale up your technology and you could add things onto such a chart showing what markets might be open to you as you come down that cost curve. And yeah, th those are, I would say, generally the kinds of charts that I would expect and that kind of demonstrate what a TA is and kind of what it can provide. Could you give an example, like for a, uh, you know, a director capture company or a, uh, a soil company or something like that? Just kind of like what would what would a simple TEA look like, or what would be the components of it? Yeah, so a classic case might be just a TEA for say a solid sorbent direct air capture company, and so you might imagine that such a company needs to uh, procure land to install their equipment, they need to lay a concrete foundation, they need to purchase or make the machines, fans, air contactors, desorption equipment, heating, CO2 uh, se separation equipment, CO2 transportation, small pipelines on site. And so you'd want to try to factor in as much of that equipment as you possibly could. That equipment's going to use so much energy when it's in the process of capturing CO2. And so you want to 
capture you know, how much energy is this equipment using, how much does that cost. Uh, that plant will probably require a degree of staffing, so you'll need so much labor, and you may want to factor in not just the benefits you would pay to those laborers, but also any sort of indirect or overhead labor you might have as part of that facility. And so you may have revolving sorbent needs with time, or you may need to have water or something like that for the plant. And so you would look at all these upfront and variable needs for the plant, um, mainly, yeah, again, in terms of materials, energy, labor, and equipment. And you would assign cost factors to those things, and you would synthesize all that in the model to figure out, okay, so for each ton we capture, and then we have this ton right here, ready to do something with it, you know, what's the, what's the cost per ton that looking like? And then you can really get in a little deeper with the assessment and say, okay, well, how do we expect this to change over time? We expect the system to become more energy efficient. We expect to be able to say, have a lower cycle time. So we have a higher throughput for this equipment so we can capture more carbon with the same amount of equipment, thus providing a cost benefit there. And you can try to capture all these different ways that you might expect that process to change over time as you have all these breakthroughs and then map that out as part of the TEA to say, okay, maybe our cost per ton capture today is $600, but if we do all these, or if we have all these breakthroughs and advances, then, hey, we can get to $100 a ton, and then we can break into these larger markets. Neat. Can you say more about that, that breakthroughs thing? So, you know, I think what you said, you know, from, from a founder perspective, from somebody starting something new might sound like a, a ton of work, right? They're like, okay, where do I even get started with stuff? It sounds like what I'm hearing is that in a way, TEA is a, is a way to the tool to help you uh, kind of tell this vision about here's where we are today. Here's where we're going to be. And here's, here's these kind of iterative breakthroughs we think we can have in our process. And this is how we can get to this cost per ton. Exactly. Yeah. It, uh, the TA is certainly helpful with putting all this stuff in one place and kind of having a common understanding of what those costs are and then what you might have to do to achieve these reductions. Many startups are going to have some sense, you know, you may have a bunch of different Excel documents all over the place with different small analyses or different, uh, and they'll be to differing levels of detail too. They might be super high level, just based on precedent. They might just be on some subsystem. You may have a full TA, but the numbers might be kind of jumbled or there might be bugs or it might be incomplete or not done according to any standard or whatever it might be. And so, yeah, having that one kind of central, very well-documented, uh, organized, well-made TEA, first of all, yeah, allows you to have that common understanding of where your costs are now and, and kind of that all-inclusive cost. And then in terms of where things can go, uh, I actually put together this typology that I've uh, kind of written and, and talked about before of different ways that you can think about cost reduction for a particular process. And I won't go super deep into each one now, um, but in general, you have exogenous factors. So things that are outside of your system that change in terms of costs, like materials or energy, you know, you could take the same deck plant, but if it has cheaper electricity, then their costs per ton captured are going to be cheaper. Uh, but then there's all these different in, uh, endogenous factors that can affect things as well. So that might look like economies of scale. It might look like learning by researching. If you have some kind of research breakthrough, making it more efficient, or you find a new material or a new process or something like that. Then there's a whole category of learning by deployment, which is, uh, includes learning by doing, learning by utilizing, learning by interacting. And that's basically just these, you could almost think of them as unexpected, uh, although they're increasingly unexpected now that there's more awareness of this phenomenon. But there are these things that are maybe a little bit difficult to predict, but that just by doing something over and over and over again, you're going to have certain efficiencies or certain things will be standardized, or you'll just have certain learning that it can be hard to predict and that you can really only get by doing something over and over and over again. And there are ways to quantitatively model that. Yeah. Often they're backward looking, but you can apply them uh, to a forward looking model in tandem with these other factors to get a sense of where costs could go. And also, yeah, maybe what might need to be true, what might need to happen. Um, and you can also use that to sort of design your system to take advantage of learning. But in general, yeah, you might look at all that kind of suite of cost reduction factors or um, possibilities, and then you can try to project those forward and figure out, okay, well, here are our costs today that we know, you know, we're already paying bills or we already have a sense of this is what it would look like if we were to operate at scale today. And then, yeah, here's where it can go over time. 
I'm curious about, um, so with all the, the teams that we work with through the Accelerator program, um, you know, investors that are interested in these things that are even ideas or kind of prototypes, um, you know, they're, they're asking these questions too. Like what, you know, is this, does this actually remove carbon from the air overall? Kind of, is this, is this going to, um, does this make economic sense? Uh, I'm curious, kind of what what's at that other end? You 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 mentioned, I think something about like even at the stage of an idea, what's like what's a really what's like the smallest TEA you've ever seen? Like, have you ever put a TEA on a napkin or something? Like, what? Yeah, like what's what's the the extreme end look like in terms of minimal? Yeah, so it's funny you say napkin. I probably have done super high level calculations, not quite on a napkin, um, but on on a note card, you know, where it's like, hey, I wonder what the Cost. I think it was for like reverse water gas shift or something like that, um, where you can get um, CO by re reacting CO2 with hydrogen. But um, uh, and so then, yeah, you can feed that into, you can combine that with hydrogen and then feed it into Fisher Tropes and get low carbon fuels. And uh, I was just doing some quick modeling. I think it maybe I even did it in my head or something. because uh -huh. um, I was just thinking through, but I hesitate to call that a TEA because you're supposed to. Uh, at least according to the guidelines I use from the Global CO2 Initiative, you're supposed to go through this pretty rigorous process of defining the goal in tandem with the commissioner and setting the scope of the study and collecting all this inventory data and then calculating your indicators and then doing this iterative interpretation phase where you're trying to figure out, okay, is this data good enough to allow us to calculate what we need to calculate to meet the goal of this study? So it's supposed to be pretty rigorous. And so it's maybe more of just a super high level cost calculation rather than like a TEA, but in effect, yeah. Yeah. if you view TEA as just, uh, the goal of it is just calculating that final cost figure. You can at a very, very, very high level do that very quickly. But uh, as with many things, the devil's in the details. And sometimes when you really dig into things, it can really change what that high level result might be when you consider all these other factors. So it's, it's a heuristic and it can be useful to some extent uh, as a kind of screening, but yeah, it's not necessarily like a full study. Yeah, interesting. So maybe there's a language shift there from like, you know, lightweight TEA to being like, well, actually the TEA is this thing and you should do like, you know, napkin cost modeling or napkin curve modeling or carbon modeling, but that's not like TEA is really, you know, it's, it's actually this, this pretty clearly defined process. Yeah, and I, I would say probably, although I don't necessarily want to start getting into the terminology world, because it's <laughs> a hard world to control anything, because there's just so much organic evolution of language, sure. the terms we use for things. But yeah, if we can control it, I, I would say, yeah, one is a high level screening cost estimate, and the other is, you know, a, a rigorous TEA. Yeah, okay, that's good. Let's, let's do it. Um... I'm curious, so we've talked about kind of what startups care about and, and how somebody kind of running a company thinks about this, but this kind of analysis is I'm always, I'm always struck by like, this is really important for everybody who's interested in carbon removal to, to know about this, right? This is like, this is, this is where it actually comes together. Um, what do you think, do you have any thoughts on like, what is somebody who's not starting a carbon removal company need to know about, about techno-economic assessment. Somebody who's like, I'm just thinking of examples, like, you know, somebody who, who's uh, thinking of, of joining one of these companies, working on a solution, or somebody's just learning about this topic for the first time, like what, and, and they, you know, and they hear about techno-economic assessment, like, why should they care? Or what, what, what should they know about this? So this was actually something that I dealt with a bit in my previous role at 12, where I worked as a techno-economic analyst, and I came across many people in the company who were working on something totally different. I mean, it was all, of course, I mean, there were support functions and more technical functions, more people. Some people were closer to TA than others, but in general, I tried really hard and people were pretty receptive to, um, to like learn about the, the TA. Or on my end, I was communicating about it and then others were learning about it. And in general, I tried to make the case that, well, it's important that we all understand maybe what needs to happen or what needs to be true for us to come down this cost curve. And, you know, of course, if you're in a technical role and you have to make a decision and it's like, okay, do we focus the next three weeks of our lab work on 
this on, on finding a new material or trying to figure out a way to decrease cycle time? A TEA can help you answer that question. Um, but if you're working, say, on, in human resources, you know, you're going to be further from that TA and it won't have as much relevance to you. However, what I would say is that many people, if they're joining an early stage startup, they might view it as sort of a risk to themselves or their career. And if you have uh, at least a rudimentary understanding of costs and cost curves and these kinds of things, you might be able to do a quick assessment for yourself to say, okay, does this even have a chance of working? Like, should I work here or not? And just, you know, using that kind of basic thought process, because there are some technologies or processes that maybe the the costs are so high or the equipment is just so yeah. theoretical or it's just so out there and maybe certain people uh, aren't so risk loving, you know, and maybe yeah. want to think like, oh, this is way too risky for me. I really don't think this is going to work out. I should go to a startup that, you know, maybe has a little bit less technical risk or maybe has a slightly higher chance of meeting cost targets or something. Um, and I think it's just interesting. Of course, I'm biased because <laughs> this is my life. And so, you know, that's also partially why I stayed I kept doing it and keep doing it. Um, also, yeah, it feeds into my interest, but yeah. <laughs> that's super interesting. Um, it just sparks some idea of like, imagine somebody going into a job interview and they've got like the, I guess, like, you know, here's five questions to ask about it, It's not a TEA, but it's like a, a cost curve or, or cost analysis. And somebody going into a job interview, it, it, I mean, imagine it, somebody like, going into a job interview for a human resources job at a carbon removal company that they wouldn't be kind of at the front of the technical exposure of that it wouldn't necessarily be relevant for their day-to-day -day work but it very much would be relevant for like do I think this company is going to be around do I want to be a part of what this like do I want to contribute kind of at this at this level of of risk it's curious to think about that as a thing like yeah people that's totally something that people should be thinking about as they're switching careers into carbon removal is, yeah, do I, do I, do I believe in, in this company's model? Certainly. And cost reduction is also an all hands on deck endeavor too. And even though you might work in a different function than, you know, even so anything on the technical team or as an analyst or something, it's important to understand, okay, what does this company need to do so that we can get our costs down so that we can compete maybe with uh, your decarbonization pathways, if you're trying to you know, offer offsets or something, but just other carbon removal. Right now, yeah, it's a seller's market, but eventually we're probably going to hit this equilibrium where there will be competition. And if one DAC company is selling for $200 a ton and another selling for $100 a ton, and it's both permanent and it's all verified, um, why wouldn't you go with the cheaper one? <laughs> you know, Unless you're trying to support someone in your area or support a particular technology or company or something, but over the whole market, there's going to be more funds flowing to cheaper solutions, all else equal. And so uh, due to that, there, there is pressure to get costs down, both to just a generally tolerable level, but also so that these companies can ultimately, you know, in, in long run be competitive. So yeah, and some, uh, you know, obviously the person working in human resources or even accounting may not necessarily have as much direct influence who knows, sometimes there's a bifurcation, there's uh, different paths that a company can go down and they can only pick one and it might have implications for their ultimate unit economics. And then maybe everyone in the company can play a part in influencing which path they take. And so, yeah, I generally tend to think it's, it's pretty important to understand. And it's also, I think just generally, even for people outside the industry, if we look at an analogy with like electric vehicles or something like many, People kind of commonly talk about, oh, when will the EV be as cheap as, you know, an internal combustion engine car and what are the life, lifetime costs and these things? And it, that kind of cost, I mean, it does leak into just like the public domain kind of, uh, yeah. you have uh, just general discourse about these technologies. And so it's just good for people to have a rel like a more informed understanding of where these costs can go so that it can inform their decision-making and approval and um, other things they might be thinking about in terms of this, this field of technology. That's interesting. Yeah. That, that public, public knowledge or broader knowledge it makes me think about, I mean, people as they're starting to, to vote on, uh, I mean, for, for the most part, carbon rule right now is voluntary markets, but, um, you know, it's assuming to grow into more compliance or government mandatory kind of markets. 
Um, and so people are going to be asked to vote on things in some, in some fashion, or politicians are going to be asked to make decisions based on these things. Um, and so it sounds like it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be a part of kind of the, the overall knowledge of carbon removal. That's really cool. Um, yeah, it's got that's so much, so much potential there. Um, yeah, I have um, kind of last, last question around, um, I mean, it's something that, that you're really great at. You've got a ton of experience at. Um, and so for people that are new in their careers in carbon removal or thinking about pivoting into carbon removal, um, can you talk about, uh, you know, how, how did you, how did you get into this? Like from the, from the early, from the early stages, like where, yeah, just what's your, what's your story? What's your story, Grant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could share a little about that. So when I was in undergrad, I, um, I mean, this is going kind of far back, but I, I got involved through an internship with this place called the Southeast Michigan Regional Energy Office. And I was a finance major at the time. And so I got involved oh. in like uh, clean energy financing models and figuring out how municipalities, particularly in Southeast Michigan, might be able to afford like renewable energy and energy efficiency interventions for their cities and how might they be able to finance it? How should they think about it? Especially because a lot of these um, municipalities uh, were kind of cash strapped, especially you know after the Great Recession and these things. So this is like a summer internship kind of thing, or a yeah, th this was back in undergrad. So I worked yeah. with them. Then when I uh, got back to school that year, I just I figured out oh a lot of these same models could actually apply to the University of Michigan where I was studying at the time. And so <laughs> I got involved with this huge team, and we were advocating for the university to. Um, do a power purchase agreement for renewable energy procurement, and then eventually establish a revolving energy fund. And so I built wow. all these models and we gave these presentations and it was this whole like almost campaign strategy of trying to lobby yeah. these different people to do it. Ultimately, the university did sign um, a pretty significant green power purchasing agreement with our local wow. utility to procure 100% of their um, energy from renewable sources. And they established a uh, I think it's a $25 million revolving energy fund too. So it was like, I, I, you know, got hooked after those wins. Cause I was like, whoa, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, wow. to be real. But uh, when I was doing that, I got involved with some people from the global CO2 initiative uh -huh. and they had really good marketing uh, and they had a really <laughs> cool website. And I was like, and part of their marketing was, oh, we're going to support the technologies because they do carbon capture and utilization. Um, and have now gotten maybe a little more into carbon removal, but they, you know, made these very bold claims, like we're going to support the technologies that will abate, uh, you know, 10% of global emissions. I think originally it was by 2030, maybe they changed to 2050. I don't totally remember, but I remember just being like, whoa, I don't know too much about that. Like I should chat with these people. And I was sort of involved with some of them through these early efforts um, with the decarbonization efforts at, at U of M. And so then I, you know, um, bugged them for a long time, eventually got a summer research assistantship, and then that continued all throughout graduate wow. school. Um, and so I was working as a researcher there. And then I was, um, upon graduation uh, from grad school, that's when I worked full time as a researcher there doing techno-economic assessment, life cycle assessment, and uh, so supporting things. And so, yeah, I, in some sense, you could say I just kind of fell into it, um, you know, but it's always difficult looking back. I mean, things are always kind of nonlinear and, um, you know, I got into it, got more interested, but I maybe could have done other things in the time, but I like stayed and stuck with it. Um, and then, yeah, several months into that, uh, the research assistantship is when I joined air miners and then I really got hooked, you know, and I was like, wow, this is so neglected, uh, relative to solar and wind and EVs and LEDs and these kinds of things. And so I want to, Make the biggest impact I can with my career, and so yeah, of course I want to work on something that's relatively more neglected uh, than you know these other pathways. So, yeah, and then it all evolved, and here I am today. Wow, that's freaking cool! I I love the the story about the the internship at the beginning that kind of was this project that then it got you some like yeah these like early wins for something that might otherwise be kind of. Uh, theoretical or very just kind of numbers based, but then you, you actually put it to use really fast and you got the university to change what they're doing. That's freaking crazy. That's oh really yeah, interesting. I wonder if there's something about that in people kind of shifting careers where it's like, if you can try something and you get like this iterative win, 
Um, you talked like learning by doing, right? Like that just seems like that was an engine that really was that that spark at the beginning where you went and for, I didn't know you were a, yeah, a finance major um, to to uh, now working on techno-economic assessment and carbon removal. That's really cool. Yeah, you could, yeah, you could say it's like that or you could say it's like gambling, you know, like you go, <laughs> you win once, you get hooked. And then hey, it's like, cool. I should do this all the time. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that's dopamine healthier. thing. Yeah, you also mentioned non, uh, you mentioned it's non-linear. Um, so much is like that. I actually made me wonder, like, are there any systems, are there any natural systems that actually are linear? Because so much stuff seems like we're always sort of looking for linear systems and there's just, this is not, it's kind of, kind of, kind of like you fall into stuff, uh, you try things. Um, so I definitely, I definitely recognize that in, in, in your, in your path is, yeah, you try things and things work and things don't work and you try new things. Um, so nice, nice to hear that story from you. Oh yeah. Any, uh, any last words? <laughs> 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 Um, um yeah <laughs> last words um i don't know let's keep pushing uh i feel like we need a um like a motto or a slogan in air miners because when i was an undergrad and uh, i ran this club students for clean energy and our like little tagline that we would use to sign emails with was keep it clean and so i feel like um may maybe there already is one for air miners but like suck it out or <laughs> like something yeah a nice. slogan that can nice. be our, you know, a sign off. off. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jason would love that for events too, right? Like, uh, yeah, we did. Somebody came up with a handshake. Did you come up with the handshake? Somebody did. It's like, um, it's like if, it, if an Aaron's handshake would be, I haven't done it because it's like in person, but it's like mm -hmm. you go like this, like you grab carbon and then you fist bump. It's like, whoosh, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, then let's go. Let's call it a day there. Nice seeing you, Grant. Thanks for taking the time. And um, uh, yeah, oh, maybe you can, uh, you, so what's, what's your, uh, your website if people want to connect with you? Oh, yeah. Uh, Carbonbasedconsulting.com. Carbonbasedconsulting uh, yeah, find me on LinkedIn. Or find right. me on Airminers and DM That's me. That's right. Yes. Late night DMs. All right. See you, Grant. Yeah. Thank you.